Sarah Karloff, I want to welcome you to the show. Uh, we have a true Hollywood royalty joining me on, on my show for Sports and Hip Hop with DJ Mad Max, the horror shows edition for October. As I said, Hollywood royalty icon. Sarah Karloff is joining me here on the show here tonight. Sarah, welcome to the show. How is your night going? How is your October? I know you have an upcoming show, too, that you're going to be at. I do. It's Chilla Theater in Port Symphony, New Jersey. That's and right. It's it's Halloween weekend. It's Friday night. Starts at six, and runs till eleven, and then all day Saturday and all day Sunday. It's a wonderful show. There's at least one of everything and one of everybody there. I've been doing it for like twenty six years. Wow. I think there was one in two thousand two. I think you were able to be with Bela Junior, Ron Chaney. I think was it Monsters of Filmland. Um, probably, yes. We've all done the show um at least once. Yeah, it's a you, great show. Oh, I believe it. And it, there's just so much knowledge that's just spread around in those shows because there's just so much history there with the Universal Studios monsters and in the, all the movies that were made back then. I did have a question because I know your father, he didn't like the term horror. He preferred terror. So That's when right. was he given this name, the master of horror? Was it after he passed away or was it when he was still alive? Oh, I think it was when he was still alive. Okay, yeah. good. I mean, he made it known that he preferred the word terror, but horror really depicts the genre overall and includes the films he made. But he was really talking about the kind of films he made. And um, he felt that terror denoted a film that invited the participation of the audience and their imagination and and horror was more blood and gore and sort of dumped it in the laps of the audience um he preferred something a little more refined than some of the films today when you look at back at the films that your father was in it, it relied on terror because there wasn't any blood and gore and that's this was my introduction into the horror universe was watching your father's work because that was the only thing that was pretty much age appropriate when I was a young kid at the age of four or five growing up so that's what my parents showed me that was my introduction and as we said before it relied on terror there wasn't any blood and gore so it was and it's age appropriate for anyone who's just starting out who's a fan of horror well, I think I think that's right. It it really uh, involves the audience's intelligence, imagination. Um, it it may be scary, but it's not revolting. Uh, it's not uh, it's not blood and gore. It's it's um, it involves the participation of the audience's imagination and intelligence, and uh, sort of wondering what's coming next instead of. Uh, instead of just putting it up on the screen. And it's the kind of terror that uh, a good book is made of, a good play is made of, and a good film is made of. I that agree. was my father's opinion. I agree. And he has such a lengthy history just being in England, being born there, and, and going all the way out to Canada and learning about his story. And it, it, it really was such a thrilling ride to read. And, and it should humble anyone that's trying to get into the entertainment business because of all the work that he put in. And his first big break was Frankenstein, and he did 80 films prior. And it's just insane to see the journey that he had to go on and just going out to Canada. And he basically was when he got the, the repertory opportunity and he was doing some auditions, I heard that he basically had to tell people that, yeah, I was in all these plays that I saw back when I was in England. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You've done your homework. That's absolutely true. He he uh, he said that he uh, he had been in all the plays that he'd only seen in England and uh he was a, he he presented himself as an experienced British actor when in fact he'd only seen the plays. He um he his he told the story on himself that his salary was thirty dollars a week when he stepped foot on a stage and it, when the curtain went up on his first performance and it was fifteen dollars a week when the curtain came down on his first performance because it was abundantly clear he'd never. He'd never stepped foot on a stage before, but at least he still had a job. 
And uh, he worked for three repertory theater groups uh, during his 10 years in British Columbia, sometimes getting paid, sometimes not, sometimes painting sets, st uh, sets and sometimes building sets, sometimes driving a truck, sometimes working for the British Columbia um, um, Electric Company, sometimes working for driving a truck, doing all sorts of things, anything to sustain himself while he was a starving actor. And um, he learned his trade. Fortunately, he said he was a quick study. So when they did three to five plays a week, uh, he was able to learn the lines. And um, he got um, on, on the job training. And uh, he felt he was very fortunate uh, to have um, been able to spend his life doing something he really passionately loved and then eventually be paid for it. Yeah. It's just amazing to, to hear how some of the performances early on in his career, I was reading, I think, for like $5 that he was getting. It's crazy when you look back on the times and it makes you reflect on the current times that actors are going through because your father was one of the founders of the Screen Actors Guild. So I would really would love to know what he would have thought about the sh current strike going on today. I think he would have agreed with the actors. Um, you know, you, you need to be paid for the work that you do. And when your work is used and reused and reused, when you're not being paid for it, he wouldn't have agreed with that at all. That was the whole purpose of SAG was to the forming of SAG was to see that the rights of actors were protected and to give a voice to the up and coming actors. He had certainly paid his dues. Uh, you know, he had worked you know, up to 19 hours a day. Uh, he had uh, uh, lost 25 pounds during the making of Frankenstein. He was already a starving actor. And as you said, Frankenstein was his 81st film. And as he said, nobody saw the first 80. So <laughs> um, he, he'd he been around, he'd been in the business 20 years and suddenly became an overnight star. So uh, 10 years in British Columbia and 10 years in Hollywood before anybody knew he was there. So um, it was it, the... To help him form the Screen Actors Guild was very, very important to him because he felt that the up and coming actors needed a vehicle by which they could voice their complaints and their uh, their needs. And um, before the formation of SAG, there was no way a, an actor could speak up and be heard and be listened to and uh, have a vehicle by which to do so. And he really did because it was brave actors during that time because they could have just been out of work because they were fighting for something that wasn't well, on the popular. They were forming so. a union, yeah. and um, my mother told the story that they would go to parties and 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 on the dance floor they'd dance by one another and whisper, "Meeting Tuesday night at so and so's house," and dance right on by. Uh, they'd park their cars blocks away from one another's houses and walk to the meetings it was it was putting their careers on the line they could have been blackballed forever and never worked again um it, it's uh, amazing that sag was ever successfully formed those those um 15 actors that formed sag were putting their careers on the line and they made a sacrifice 100%. I did, when I was doing my research just on the movie and Frankenstein, your father's work, I learned that your father had a back injury on while working on Frankenstein. Is that correct? He um, injured his back, um, and he subsequently had three back surgeries. Wow. Yeah. Um, it, he loved to garden, and so I think... Um, that didn't help his back either following the film, but he did uh, car carrying Colin Clive up the back hill of Universal over and over and over again. That that scene was shot and reshot. Um, didn't help his back and he did injure it. And then carrying him um, up the tower and there were not doubles used at all. And my father was 
not uh, well known at all at that point in his career. So he would not have earned the right to have a double. Wow. So he was actually doing all that carrying of Colin Clive. And uh, James Whale was a taskmaster, to say the least, as a director. And um, uh, he he worked his actors very hard. You could tell just by doing the research and just learning about what he went through and that that would pretty much spark he would want better work and conditions and how SAG really formed. And even with Frankenstein, learn about it and him getting cast by James Whale. He was in the right commissary at the right time. He wanted to see if your father would be interested in testing for the monster. And we all know how that played out. But what's interesting is when you look at the credits, there's the question mark and they wanted to make Colin Clive the star of it. So when did, because your father is completely taken over the screen. When we think of Frankenstein, we, we think of your father. So when did your, your father start to get that recognition because he was the question mark, but at the end of the film is kind of when he got the recognition in the credits in the end, when did he start to get that recognition that, that he was pretty much bigger than Colin Clive? Well, um, it wasn't a competition, wasn't intended to be yeah. um, a competition. Uh, they did expect Colin Clive to be the star of the, of the film quite naturally. Uh, but my father wasn't even invited to the premiere. I did hear that. Yeah. So, he, you know, it, it it was a, it was quite a while before my father saw the whole film. And um, that just shows you how long it was before um, he was recognized as the star. But I think it was immediately recognized that the creature was the, big deal of the film uh, before my father actually got recognized as the star they had to first figure out who was under all that makeup and then the studio had to begin to give him recognition oh. they had to figure out what Boris Karloff looked like even though he was given credits at the end for being the monster they had to figure out what he really looked like <laughs> And I heard that they were already shooting the film before they even casted your father as the monster. That's right. Um, they had, um, of course, Lon Chaney Sr. would have been uh, cast had he not unfortunately died early uh, on. And uh, then, of course, the role was offered to Bela Lugosi. And he turned it down because there was uh, there were no lines in the in the role and um because of all the makeup and so they were still casting around looking for um who should play the role and then as you said earlier my father was in the commissary when um james whale was in in there and my father had just done uh the criminal code and uh, yeah and um um, which was a pretty showy part. And so um, James Will evidently said to invited my father over for a cup of coffee to his table and um, said he had an interesting face and um, um, asked if he would test for the, the role in a movie he was doing. And of course, my father was uh, just doing extra parts uh, and uh, he would do he would test for anything at that point, and it was thanks to the to the brilliant makeup of of Jack Pierce. My father always said he was the best in the business and absolutely a genius. And I believe they took almost two weeks to perfect <clears throat> what they considered to be the the right makeup for the role, and um, um, they. Uh, ran tests, uh, screen tests, and and uh, my father studied how he felt the role should be played, and they did a screen test, and he was cast in the in the role, and the rest then became cinema history. It, it did, and I think your father really paved the way for a lot of actors in Hollywood because with a non-speaking role, you really have to 
show a side of creativity that a lot of people don't have. And you mentioned it before, the movements in his hands, the grunts, the facial expressions. It because a lot of times people, especially in horror, they they like to say, especially if they're wearing a mask or they have a non-speaking role, well, that's not really acting. That's what they'll usually say, but that's not true because you still have to convey some sort of presence in in order to play the part. And your father paved the way for a lot of the, the 80s, like the Jasons, the Michaels, in a way, even though they're wearing a mask, they still had to have screen presence and do different things to act in the film. Well, my father, <clears throat> excuse me, my father had, I think, three things he used in his acting. Um, his hands, they, he had beautiful hands and he used them when he reached up toward the light, you could see how expressive his hands were. And he used that in a lot of his, a lot of his roles. Um, his voice, he could do anything with his voice. Of course, he didn't use it until Bride of Frankenstein, but um, he could do anything with his voice. He could terrify you. He could soothe you. He could um, um, make you laugh. He could do anything with his voice. It was highly recognizable. And his eyes. He could terrify you once again with his eyes. He could scold you. Certainly, I know that. He could scold you with his eyes. Uh, he could soothe you. He ate. So those three things he used extremely well in his acting. For the Frankenstein role, he had um, his legs were um, in braces, and that added to the way he walked. And um, and he developed the the creature's walk and his slight leaning forward. Those were all ways my father interpreted the role. Um, somebody else playing it would have given it a different interpretation. I think the way my father portrayed it elicited empathy and sympathy. Um, um, my father always said the children got it. They understood that the creature was the um, victim and not the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that is the way that role has gone down in cinema history as a sympathetic um, um character and not a villain no. and i think it's due to his portrayal of it i agree and he even befriended the child actress on the set the one that he oh, the yeah. character ends up throwing into the water he had even befriended her yes she always wanted to ride with him in the car and hold his hand and and everything he um he did he he was wonderful with children and um he at one point in his career he made twenty plus children's recordings, albums um, of just so stories and Rudyard Kipling's just so stories and and um, uh, Hans Christian Andersen and and all sorts of wonderful fairy tales, and uh, of course he had the voice to do it. You know he could he could soothe you or scare you so. <laughs> Uh, he had the voice to do it, and those recordings are absolutely wonderful. Uh, and of course, he's the Grinch. Yeah, uh, he won a Grammy for How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and um, he was not only the narrator, but he was the voice of the Grinch. And um, um, I just learned last year that he did it in one take. I did hear about that's that's how you know your father was a true genius. Just one oh. take. One take on that, uh, changing from character to character. Um, and the, those lyrics are very difficult lyrics. And those uh, voices, I mean, he used the narration voice and then the Grinch voice and switched back and forth. And those are really tricky lyrics. And to do that in one take is just, just absolutely amazing. But my father was so not into awards that when he when he um got his uh, he he couldn't he was in england when the grammy awards were given out so he asked his agent to go um, receive the award for him the doorstop <laughs> yeah, right and so when he when he uh 
um, came over and went to his agent's office. His agent says, here, Boris, here's your Grammy. And my father took it and looked at it and turned it around and looked at it and said, it looks like a bloody doorstop. <laughs> and he took it and put it over on it, uh, his agent's door and he left it there. And you got it back because I know you yeah, you have the back. award. Yeah. Years later, years and years later, I got it back. So he wasn't into awards, but he was into devotion to his trade. And it shows just how modest he was and just hearing the stories of him giving back to children and going down to the hospital in Baltimore and handing out presents and, and dressing up for the kids. It's just amazing to hear how well he was just with people. And he really is a true saint just on and off the screen. And it, it, he has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, one for yes, movies he does. and television. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He was a he was a lovely human being. He was um, highly respected uh, by his peers and and dearly loved by those that knew him. My um, godmother wrote a book about him, and she said a biography, and she said that almost to a person when. She did interviews of people who knew him. They preface their remarks by saying, oh, dear Boris. And so she titled the book, Dear Boris. Wow. Yeah, he's definitely a saint. There's no doubt about it. And I love your father's work, just from Frankenstein, The Mummy, Out of Bay, just, and just reading the reaction from audiences that it chilled their spines when he opened his eyes. And you mentioned it, his eyes were yeah. one of his top factors as an actor. It, it just sent the chills up the audience's spine with that role. And then that's kind of a, a two-part. He had to be silent as the mummy. And then once he played Out of Bay, he had speaking yeah, lines. And, you know, that's not a terror or horror film. That's a, rom that's a romantic film, really. It's a romance. And that's True. what that whole film is about, really. Yeah. You're and the right. sets on that are magnificent. They really are. Yeah, I love watching that film and just learning about archaeology and just the history of mummification. It, 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 that's something I loved about those films, too, is that it taught a lot about history and just different books that you read in literature that I think a lot of films today lack. And there's just something about those films that came out of the Universal Studios that are just timeless art pieces. And it, it, it's amazing to see the contributions that your father had and then seeing him go on. And, and then he was in the original Scarface too. That was, I mean, he's a real versatile actor when you look at his work and then to go on to Abbott and Costello, meet the killer. Did, did yeah. he ever t tell you about what it was like working with Abbott and Costello? Oh, he said, you know, you never knew what was going to happen on the set. <laughs> I mean, they 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 were they were so funny, so funny. And my father had a wonderful sense of humor. He, he had did. a typical British sense of humor. <laughs> so he loved he loved comedy wherever he found it. And what's interesting about that film when you look back at it, because when you see in the title "Meet the Killer," comma Boris Karloff, in the end he isn't the killer. But when you're watching the film. And when you read the title, they are alluding to that your father was going to be playing the killer almost. Sure, sure. That's the catch. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about being typecast. But he was asked often if he minded being typecast. And he always said, oh, heavens no, how lucky I am to have been typecast. It kept me a working actor all my life. I did, I did learn about that when doing the research behind the scenes. And even with Son of Frankenstein, you were born on his birthday and you say that you were his most expensive birthday gift. <laughs> it, it, there was one time, I think it was on the set I was reading, where he thought that he was actually in a scene and he was surprised with the birthday cake. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. And there is a... Um, um, story that goes around that he went to the hospital in his costume uh, which is not true one they would never have let him off the set two uh he would never have been let in the hospital and three there is a wonderful photograph of him at the hospital in very dignified clothes 
with the nurse holding me. There you go. Aren't you good? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, yes, that takes away that story. And uh, people say, is it true? Is it true? He went to the hospital in his Frankenstein clothes, and I refer to that picture. <laughs> yeah, no, he didn't show up with it. I did. Thank you for clarifying that, because I was going to ask you if that was true, because I saw the picture there. And I said, it just doesn't add up when you read the story and then you see the picture and there was no picture no, in the makeup. <laughs> of course not. They wouldn't have let him off the set that way. He wouldn't have gone off the set that way. They, no. you know, they're not going to let, then they, they wouldn't have let the cat out of the bag as to what the, what the wardrobe was going to be for the film. If for no other reason, other than he would, wouldn't have dreamt going and who would have, Think of the heart attacks on the on the way to the hospital it would have caused. Hilarious. And yeah. Son of Frankenstein was the pretty much the last one there with him playing the monster in a motion picture on screen. Do you know if your father ever regretted that, you know, with all the Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein? And I think you had Frankenstein meets the wolf, man. Do you know if you ever kind of second guessed that maybe it would have been so iconic for me to portray the character in those later films? Or he was just confident at that point that it, it's best I put this character to rest with Son of Frankenstein. No, he never regretted it. He felt that that, that um, it was time to let the monster creature rest. He felt that it, uh, he didn't want to, he owed the, that role a, it made such a pivotal difference in his life, both personally and professionally, one. Two, he felt that the role and the character had reached a point that beyond which it would become the brunt of bad scripts, bad jokes, um, and he didn't want to have any part of, of of doing that, of demeaning the character. Um, and um, it did get to be rather a foolish character in some of the following films. I agree, and, yeah. He he just uh, he never regretted his decision and it was his decision Not i think he made the best it. decision too yeah. when you look back on it there's no one that was able to portray it the way that he did it and you are a fan i know you're a wuss when it comes to horror movies i've read that directly <laughs> from the quote that's right <laughs> but you do like young frankenstein and i read online that you said your father would have been proud of the film oh he would it's it's a wonderful film. Yeah. It stands on its own legs. But also, it, it, it's so funny. My father would have laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed at it. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's a wonderful film. And uh, he would have loved the humor in it. He would have loved the the acting in it. The acting in it is, is superb. Um, he would have laughed his head off. Yeah. What's not to like about young Frankenstein? I mean, my goodness, walk this way. I mean, come on. It is so funny. And and, and just like um um Bobby Pickett's song. Monster he Mash. even sang that himself on a television program. Uh, you know, uh it's a compliment. It's yeah. all of it is a compliment to uh, a, a role he uh, he didn't create it. The role itself was a wonderful, magical combination of talents. It was first Mary Shelley, uh, although the film didn't follow her story, but it was first Mary Shelley, and then it was it was Colin Clive, and it was James Whale, and it was Jack Pierce, and it was my father. And it was this, just this wonderful combination of talents and efforts and that made this film and it became cinema history. It became iconic, but it was a collection of input uh, that made this film iconic. So, um, and anything that follows it and, and imitates it or, or uh, pokes fun at it like um, young Frankenstein is a compliment. And 
my father would have taken it as such and he would have loved the humor in it and admired the acting in it. Yeah, I, it would definitely, I, I agree with you on that. I think he would have, like you said, it was a compliment and I, I did bring up before because his son Frank is now was the last time that he played the monster on a motion picture, but there was also, I was reading online and I have a picture here route 66. I think he was there with Lon Chaney jr. I have a photo yeah. here. And yeah. this was like the last time I read that he yeah. put on that makeup. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, I'm i surprised he did that, but he did it because of the script. That's and, amazing. Yeah. And he also put it on again for a charity baseball game. Wow. Where he was the umpire. Oh, yeah. And I heard that someone fainted. Was that right? I don't know. Yeah, because I did read that someone fainted at the celebrity or was scared by it. I did read about that. that he was at a celebrity charity baseball game. Well, it it could be. Yeah. I don't know. That's kind of, I don't know. And we mentioned the, the singing before about him singing, you know, with the Monster Mash. And he actually did a duet with Vincent Price on TV. Mm hmm. And he sang on Broadway and Peter yeah. Pan. Uh, it's. I, I've heard people say he had a nice, had a good voice. Um, I. I would hesitate to say, keep your day job, but I'm not that crazy about his singing voice. But I mean, he did Peter Pan and sang in that and and um, um, the skies didn't fall down. So, um, but he sang in a lot of things and he sang some pretty awful things on on television some some oh what was the name of the show that he sang on i can't remember mm -hmm. uh and the name of the song but it was part of being an actor you do what the script says yeah. but fortunately he didn't sing me to sleep at night <laughs> When we look at the Raven too, because I brought up Vincent Price, did he? What was his experience of collaborating with Vincent? Because he's another icon. Did he? What was his story of being on set and being able to work with him? Oh, he and Vincent were good friends, and um, uh, they knew each other very well. And Vincent, I'm told, used to carry me around on his shoulders. Um, wow. poor, poor Vincent. Um, <laughs> but um, no, they were good friends. They were good friends. And if you want to ask me about Bela. I oh, yeah, that, that was going to be something. Because I read that online that there was some competition, but I did read that it was just media hype. Well, it was media hype. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, I never met Bela. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard my father ask that question on interviews and I know that he always complimented Bela as being a very fine actor uh, and saying uh, uh, that uh, Bela was Hungarian and had his own personal interests and my father was British and had his own personal interests and and it's quite natural for, for actors to work together and um, uh, and not socialize together. May if they do a film, they may not see each other a, again uh, socially unless they work together again. That's not unusual in today's world at all. No. Um, uh, they um, so they had their own personal interests and didn't socialize together. But my father always said that Bela was a fine, fine actor, well trained. And uh, the mistake he made was not learning the English language better uh, because it was the language in which he uh, uh, earned his bread and butter. Yeah. 
You're, you're right. And I, I did read about that. And especially with his TV show thriller and the unfortunate with what happened with that was the competition with Alfred Hitchcock with his show. And that's why it fell short. Um, it was requested that thriller not be renewed. Man. Yeah. Cause I know fans are always big on, Oh, they wish they saw a collaboration between Alfred Hitchcock and your father. It's just unfortunate that that there was a that, that request that you mentioned. Yes, man. Yeah, he's he's definitely got a a lengthy body of work. And when we look at his filmography, Targets is your favorite. Targets is one of my favorite films he did. I love it. Um. He's essentially playing himself. Um, it reflects uh, my father's own belief that the real horror is on the street, not up on the screen. Um, it was it reflected the horror of the times. That's why it was pulled from the theaters prematurely and shelved for a long time. It's unfortunately as um, a, 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 as applicable today as it was when it was made. Uh, there's as much or more violence today on the streets as when Targets was made. Um, it's I, I think it's a fine film. Um, my father really enjoyed working with Peter Bogdanovich. Um, he admired his creativity and his uh, abilities. It was the first film that Peter uh, had directed and created himself. Um, they use uh, my father owed uh, Roger Corman ten minutes time uh, from a previous uh, contract, and so uh, Peter was given the assignment to use that 10 minutes in, in a new film. And so uh, my father's time ran well over 10 minutes and my father donated the balance of his time to it because he uh, admired and enjoyed working with Peter so much. And you brought up Roger Corman and just working with him. Is it true that your father saw the talent in Jack Nicholson? Oh, my, evidently my father came um home one evening and said um there's a young man on the on this film and he has a very bright future he's going to go someplace and it was jack nicholson from the terror and it, he was also in um um oh my i've gone brain the raven the raven yeah yeah he definitely had an eye for talent as well well, he saw what he saw in Jack Nicholson. Yeah. And he was right. Yeah. That came to fruition right there. And just Jack everything. Jack Nicholson is somebody I wish I I had uh, could meet. And then you could tell him the, the story, that story. Yeah, I could. I could. I'd like to tell him that. Yeah. But he doesn't come out in public much. Oh. Unfortunately not, because your your father's, yeah, he, he's had an impact on a lot of people's lives and careers and just so many fans out there and with his work. And he, he not only is the, the face of horror, the master of horror and Halloween, but as we mentioned with the Grinch. And I, I loved how just hearing the story, how he called you just out of the blue and said, <laughs> I think I did something pretty good. And he, I guess he told you and your sons to watch the tv that yeah, night you might, <laughs> like to, you might like to watch it my father never brought his work home and and uh, he never talked about other actors and he never talked to really talked about his work and one night the phone just rang and it was my dad and he said well i've done something and i think maybe you and the boys might enjoy it i think it's pretty good and for my father to say that who was so modest and so self-effacing in his humor and everything it was just amazing and he said uh, you might enjoy it <laughs> it, was it was the grinch. grinch yeah yeah pretty good yeah pretty good <laughs> iconic <laughs> yeah it was uh, wonderful 
and we speak about the other work that he's done for children, but the claymation mad monster party. I remember seeing that when I was a kid, that that's another one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uncle Boris. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little tiny figure of that. They came out with a little figure of Uncle Boris. Oh, wow. Mm. When did the merchandise, do you know when the merchandise started of your father, when all that started to release and the licensing and all? Do you know when? No, you started not, to see when it, not when it started. I think it went backwards. I mean, it didn't start when Frankenstein came out, mm -hmm. but there's sure a lot of Frankenstein merchandise. Uh, I know that when the stamps came out, uh, there was a huge uh merchandising uh drive and uh, my dad is one of the few people not just actors few people to be on um let's see uh two three stamps he's on three stamps he's on the monster series stamps he's on two of them and then later on the um film series stamps of 10 stamps of different disciplines of filmmaking He's on the one for makeup. So he's on three stamps. And other than, I think, a U.S. president, um, there's nobody else who's been on three stamps. Wow. And it's well-deserved. Well, deserved. well no about it. it's, 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 we're very proud of it as a family. I, I could tell. And he's even have his, he has his own coffee line too. I, I was reading about <laughs> Yeah. That. Uh, this wonderful young lady approached me about licensing coffee, and she's such a delight to work with and such a good businesswoman. And the coffee is very good, and um, people really like it. And when I give it to someone, they just rave about it. And it's a, it's a dark blend, and um, it's excellent. That's really good. And it's so, available on your website too. I think there's a link there. You have a yeah. yeah. Um, we have a website and we have um, a gift shop in it, and the coffee is available in there. Yeah. Yeah, they got all sorts of that things out. there. But um, and we have some tumblers that are fun. Some have the Grinch on them, and some have uh, oh, what we call the Many Faces of Boris Karloff, which is our logo, and it's something Jack Pierce did. Um, uh, it has my father's face in the middle and then it has a ring of makeups that Jack Pierce did of my dad. I think there are 11 or 12 of them and, 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 uh, the tumblers are great fun. They're, the you know, for hot things or cold thing drinks. And I don't know, we have a, we have t-shirts and magnets and all sorts of nonsense on there. <laughs> We know that Targets is the one you love. What was your father's? Because I know he didn't bring his work home, but did you ever get to know what your, your father, what he was most proud of? Which film? Was there a particular one? You know, I don't know that he that he had one, I think, for different reasons at different times. He had films that he liked better than others. Certainly Frankenstein for the pivotal difference it made in his life. Um, the Val Luton films that he did, uh, he really enjoyed working with Val Luton, uh, The Body Snatcher and Bedlam and Isle of the Dead. Um, they were really fine scripts and well directed and, and, uh, he really liked making those films, um, and working with Val, um. Is it true I, that he, with Val, he said that he saved him from the living dead and saved yeah, his soul? Yeah, he saved his soul because he'd been making some pretty awful films. And um, uh, and then he, um, I think he really enjoyed making um, a comedy of terrors and um, uh, The Raven because he got to work with Peter Laurie and Vincent Price and Basil Rathbone. And those old guys were able to um, spoof their own boogeyman images in those films. And, and 
they reached the point in their careers that they could do that to you know spoof that and the, they liked each other they'd worked together before and um in more serious roles and they just had a good time and um peter lord drove them all crazy because he never knew his lines and my father was a stickler for knowing his lines and and yet they pulled practical jokes on one another and practical jokes on Roger Corman and drove him crazy and they enjoyed doing that and it's just it was it was a fun set to visit they were fun sets to visit and they were they had a good time so I think they enjoyed doing that um certainly targets would be one that he really enjoyed making uh, so for, for different reasons at different times I think he had uh favorite films I know he loved uh, working on Broadway, instant gratification, um, all actors like that, uh, Arsenic and Old Lace, he had a long, long run with that, um, uh, and uh, Peter Pan, he loved the kids coming backstage um, and trying on, his, trying on his hook and flying across the stage and getting fairy dust sprinkled on them. Um, he he um he and he uh, really liked working with Julie Harrison the Lark. He was nominated for a Tony, um, and so he, he 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 just loved what he did. He did a huge body of radio work. He did the children's recordings. I mean, he's known for but the iconic f films that he did. He's known for the Grinch. But he also did so much radio, so much radio. And he starred on Broadway in five plays. He did the children's albums he did on radio. He had a weekly show about um, ch advice about children. Um, uh, it was a Reader's Digest show he had. Um, he had three television series of his own. He was one of the first uh, film stars to embrace the new medium of television. He moved back to New York in 49 when television was in its infancy. And it was live television instead of take one, take two, as it was in the film business. And so, you know, he, he had this huge, broad career, although he was typecast. And um, so he had it both ways. Yeah. And he did it in every media of the entertainment business. And that's not really known by a lot of his fans, the breadth of his career. But he's known by everybody as a really nice person. So um, what could be better? And his fans are wonderful. They are so kind and they're multi-generational. Um, they are so nice to me. They are so respectful of his memory and of his legacy. It's delightful to meet new fans and see old fans that I've known for years and years. Um, I've made such good friends with some of his fans, and it's just a pleasure to be his daughter. It's a privilege. Yeah, and you carry his legacy well, and just the work, and just going out there and teaching the fans just questions that they want to know, and and even just with the books that are out there and different things. Just you honor your father to the fullest, and it's well. Amazing. The fans know far more than I do. I have heard you say that that they even teach you about your father. <laughs> oh, they do. They know yeah. far more than I do. You know, fan means fanatic. And, yeah. <laughs> and I'm the wuss of the crowd that doesn't like scary movies, and I haven't seen all my father's films. You know, I leave the room during Murder She Wrote. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's really bad casting me as my father's daughter but um it's a privilege too but it's bad casting <laughs> I, I did hear and 
because I went through bullying when I was younger. I did hear you were teased. Is that right? When you were in college and just different parts of your life for being Frankenstein's sure. daughter? Sure. Yeah. I'm very grateful they made Son of Frankenstein. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sure, I was teased, but that's all right. It has, it has its, it had its drawbacks. But it certainly has its perks. Yeah. And he also had a love of cricket. I heard that he was he was in with the club there, a cricket club down oh, in Hollywood sure. with Liz Taylor. Yeah, the Hollywood cricket team. Yeah, Liz and, Taylor. Oh, Liz Taylor used to attend frequently, I'm told. And he played with Sir Aubrey Smith. And um, a lot of uh, David Niven, you know, a lot of the British... Uh, actors uh, partook of it, and um, he was a huge cricket fan. Uh, his idea of dying and going to heaven was to go to a cricket match in England. Uh, <laughs> he just loved it, and he loved gardening, and he loved animals. At one time, he and my mother had 22 dogs in Beverly Hills. and um, A pig, I heard? yeah. And they had a they had a pig named Violet, and um, they had um, turkeys and and um, you know my father my father just loved animals, and um, I don't know the, he just was the antithesis of the roles he played. He so uh, um, he was a pretty nice guy. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Do you ever see, because I've been speaking about it recently, do you ever see the Oscars giving a nod or its own category to horror films? Because I not even because I know there's horror films that are cheaply made 100 percent. But I think we should have awards that go back in history that give awards to people such as your father for their contributions to the work and just icon awards. Do you ever see horror getting that and possibly mm -hmm. the great actors of the horror genre mm -hmm. potentially no. getting honored? No, no, uh, too late. Yeah. They don't give very many posthumous awards anyway. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it's always, uh, Frankenstein is always on the hundred, uh, best film list and stuff, but I don't see any, uh, any awards my father wouldn't care anyway yeah he wasn't a big award guy no another doorstop yeah <laughs> oh. yeah so he 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 his reward was doing a good job and that's how he would want to be remembered and he is remembered as such yeah i think he is Sarah Karloff, is there anything else you would love to let the fans know? Anything else that we didn't cover here tonight? You covered everything. You really did your homework. Thank you. You did a wonderful job. It's been a wonderful interview. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Karloff. It was an honor. And you have an upcoming show. We could, if you could promote it again for the fans listening, we'd love to. Okay. Go it's and Chiller meet you there. Theater in Parsippany, New Jersey. And it's Halloween weekend. And it's from. Uh, it starts at 6 o'clock on Friday evening and runs through Sunday evening. All day Saturday, all day Sunday. It's a wonderful show. There's something there for everyone. And it's uh, really a nice show. Yeah. And I encourage people to come. There are all sorts of celebrities there signing and greeting people. And um, there's everything from one year there was everything from Russian wrestlers to scream queens. So <laughs> there's something for everyone. Was there anyone ever at one of these events and shows that you've been to as far as a celebrity that's come up to you and said that they were, they, they were impacted by your father that surprised you? Well, some come up to me or I go up to them because someone wants an autograph. I'm not a collector. And it is amazing to me uh, how awestruck they are 
by my father's name. Yeah. And how respectful they are. And how kind they are to me because of my father's name. It's amazing. Um, I've had people leap to their feet, uh, just awestruck because of my father's name. And some of these are pretty big celebrities. I'm they not are. surprised. I just, it's amazing. So, uh, he he was well respected in the business and beloved by those who knew him. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah Karloff. Anytime. We'd love to have you back on the show. If you ever have any upcoming events, anything that you would like to promote, you, you're always welcome on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's one of the best interviews I've ever been given. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Well, it is. It's true. You you did your homework more than I can tell you. <laughs> it means a lot, yeah. Sarah Carla. No, that really does. That definitely made made more than my night. I know everyone usually says that made my day, made my night, but it, it definitely means way more than that. Well, I'll do. I'll be interviewed by you any day. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah Karloff. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your night. Have a great event and have a great Halloween. Thank you. Happy Halloween. It's Thank my you. busy season. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah Karloff. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. You yeah. too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.